So, you know, this is one way you do computer simulations. And I'll try to put on a twist for those who have already seen it, so you at least see something new. So the birthday problem is, you have a group of people in a room. What is the probability that two people in the room share a birthday? Is this a well-posed problem, yes or no? So I'm definitely looking at the people who teach statistics right now. Is this a well-posed problem? <coughs> what do you mean? Exactly. So be more specific. Is it clear what I'm asking? Is it clear what the conditions of the problem are? I think it is. You think but, it is? But I always show the kids the Johnny Carson video where it's misinterpreted all the time and we can get a totally different result. So what's the Johnny Carson one? They're basically he's thinking for any given person, does is there a match to that person? Like right. does okay. somebody in this room match my right. birthday? Right. Which isn't the question. Which is a very different question. But right. I have a group of people. <coughs> in the independent room. people? Ah, so what do we mean by independent people? No, no, no. My wife is an identical <laughs> twin, so when yeah. I'm ever at a you know, family gathering on her side, there's a very good chance two people will share a birthday. Uh, leap year? Leap year. Uh, I have a deal with admissions at Williams where they will not admit anybody who was born on February 29 who wants to do not have it at a high level. And I don't have to worry about that in any of my classes. <laughs> but there's other issues. Uh, do you mean the same? Month, day, year, or just month, day? Another good issue? I just mean month, day. But that's another good issue. There's another big one. Um, I think it was Malcolm Gladwell, his book Outliers. He has a wonderful passage where he describes the Canadian Junior Hockey Championship oh, game. Yeah. And he replaces the names of the players with their birthday. Yes. You know, March 7 passes to February 28, who passes back to March 7, passes to January 29, passes to March 14, yeah. March 14 shoots, blocked by, you know, and just all of the dates at the beginning of the year. And when you look at a lot of sports leagues as to how do they make cutoffs, if you just miss the cutoff, you're basically one of the biggest kids in the league. And typically when you're young, you know, being a year older than everybody else is a huge advantage. So you look like the better player. So you get more playing time. So the coach thinks you're better. So you're recommended for the next leagues and more training and whatnot. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so you know, for people who are looking for applications or looking for fun, fun things to do, I think the birthday problem is a great thing to discuss. Because <coughs> there are all these issues that you don't even worry about at first. You think, oh yeah, it's clear. Everybody is the, all the days are equally likely. Well, that's not necessarily true depending on where I am. You can get into other things as to our birthday is distributed uniformly about the year. I'm not going to talk about what goes on at different times of the year. But um, just on sports teams, you will see these biases towards certain months. And so you can then ask you from an economics perspective, what are you doing? Do you really think that the people who happen to be born in these months are intrinsically more talented? Or are we somehow throwing away a huge chunk of our talent pool? So then the question is, how do you analyze this problem you know, that you want two people to share with this? So assume n independent B days. How big is n so that we have a 50% chance they share a B day? So how many people roughly know what the answer is to this? Yes? That's around 30? 22? Well, 22, 23. 23, yeah. yeah. By the time you get to um, 30, you're very, very safe. I've, I've, I've never lost when I've made this bet with my students. Uh, my favorite was one year I was uh, in the last row, second to last row of my calculus class, still no matches, and two people sitting next to each other had the same birthday. So how would you analyze this? How would you figure out how big it must be so that you have two people having at least a 50% chance. So we could let you know, Pn be probability there is a match in n people and Qn is 1 minus Pn. Now if we just care about 50%, either one of these is fine. So the question is which is the easier event to consider? the probability that there is a match, or the probability that there isn't a match? Say isn't a match. Okay, 
I agree that it's much easier to do the probability that there is not a match. Well, you can, I mean, uh, maybe I'm just being skewed by how I sort of walk through this with my students, right. but sort of look at the, the likelihood that each individual mm -hmm. the list has a unique birthday. Right. In other words, not a match. Good. So it's sort of the same. So that's going to be so it's going to be very easy to calculate the probability <coughs> that there's no match because each person when they come in, there's a set of birthdays they have to miss. Right. To calculate the probability that there's a match, you have to look at all the ways to have a match. You could have exactly two people share a birthday, exactly three, exactly four, exactly five. You could have two pairs of two, a pair of two, a pair of three. There's so many possibilities. So this illustrates the concept that it's a lot easier to look at one minus the probability of something happening than the probability that something happens. And so QN would be the first person can have any birthday. The next person has 364 possibilities. And you keep marching all the way down to 365 minus n minus 1 over 365. And so it's annoying that you have to remember it's an n minus 1 and not an n. Can you say that again? Sure. The first person can have any birthday. Right. The second person, when they walk in, they can't share the first person's birthday. And then when the nth person walks in, they can't share any of the n minus 1 first birthdays. Now, the problem with this is this is not necessarily easy to work with. I can represent it as 365 factorial over 365 minus n factorial times 365 to the n. As you know, there's a nice formula for it, and then just find the value of n such that this equals you know, 1 half. But this is going to be a nightmare, and we'll just overflow the calculator. So one way you can try to do this is you just keep multiplying these numbers one at a time until you get to something that's a half. But you know, this brings back one of the issues we were talking about last time. Just because I can write down a formula doesn't mean I can work with it in an efficient manner. How do I work with numbers that are this big? You know, 365 factorial, this will blow up someone's calculator. How many people here know calculus? I, I'm going to just really quickly... The word no there is a... Yes. Study the experience. So I'm going to just quickly show you... I'm going to just quickly show you how calculus can help here. Um, I can write this as a product k goes from 1 to n of 1 minus, uh, actually I'm going to go with 0 to n minus 1. 1 over, I'm sorry, k over 365. So what this means is I just take the product of all terms like this. I take k equals 0, k equals 1, k equals 2, k goes all the way up to n minus 1. And each of these factors is one of these factors up here. So this is just a really concise way of writing down what's going on. So the reason I want to do this is this is going to make it a little bit easier for me to use calculus to figure out what's going on. The other thing is when I do problems like this, I always ask my students, you know, what would be a good generalization to study? And so when you have something like this, what's a good generalization? So many questions you could ask. What's the probability three people share a birthday? What's the probability you have two pairs of two that share a birthday? What if everybody moves to Pluto? Okay, And you want to know what's the probability two people on Pluto have the same birthday. Now you have about 90,000 days in a year. So a lot of you have heard the answer, you know, it's around 23 on Earth. Okay, How does that 23 change as the number of days in a year change? Can you get some idea of how the answer depends on the number of days in a year? And so if I replace 365 with more generally you know, big D for D days in a year, what is the functional dependence of this on D? Now you could go in the lab and you could actually just start doing this experiment. You could start doing these products for different D and get a sense and see if you could sniff out what the relationship would be. So I'm going to just quickly sketch how you would do this with calculus. I don't want to spend too much time as it doesn't seem to be a huge, oh yes, I remember and love calculus so well. <laughs> whenever you see a product, do you know what you should do whenever you see a product in mathematics? Do you like taking products? Not especially. Not especially. We like to add numbers. So how can I convert a product to addition? I want to somehow convert this product to a sum. 
Do I know anything that converts products to Log cell? Rhythms. Logarithms. So if I look at the log of QM, that's going to be the sum, n goes, I'm sorry, k goes from 0 to n minus 1, of the log of 1 minus k over d. And so my students believe this logarithm is this mysterious thing that they've been forced to learn in high school without any applications. And they might even know some of the log laws, but they don't really understand what a logarithm is or why we care about it. It's a way to present data. And so if we take a logarithm here, this product now becomes a sum. We have a great understanding of how to evaluate sums. And so in fact, there's several ways to go. One way is that this logarithm can almost be replaced with an integral. Another thing that I'm just going to quickly sketch is the log of 1 minus u by calculus is approximately negative u, if u is small. So if u is small, it's approximately minus u. And what we're doing here is, you know, if I give you a function, you know, what calculus says is replace the function with a straight line, and near that value, it's a pretty good approximation. So if I approximate logarithm near 1, the log of 1 is 0, if you take the derivative, you get the log of 1 minus u is about negative u. So this sum is approximately <coughs> the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1. I can pull out the negative sign. I can pull out, well, I'll have a k over d. And so now I'm basically summing the first n minus 1 integers. And so if you've looked at the first n minus 1 integers, if I go 1 plus m, I think we might have talked about this last time, if I write the numbers backwards like this, and if I now add them, I get m plus 1 every single time. So I would get, if this is s and this is s, I would get 2s is m plus 1 m times. So my sum is just m, m plus 1 over 2. And so I would get the log of qn is about negative um, n minus 1 times n over d. And just, you know, being a little bit lazy, this will be about n squared, negative n squared over d. We're taking, if we want qn to be a half, this would then be the log of 1 half, which is negative log 2. So you get d, or so you get um, negative here, negative here cancels. When you go over, you get n squared is about d log 2, or therefore n is approximately the square root of d log 2. Oh, sorry, I dropped a half. It's n squared over 2. So I get a 2 d log 2. And so this gives you how the birthday problem would vary if you for somehow you know, were able to get to Pluto. But you can then begin to see other questions you can ask. You know, how long do I have to go before I have an alignment? And then the question is, you know, why might you care about something like this? Well, imagine you have a network. So you have a bunch of you know, uh, computers that are connected. Maybe there's a thunderstorm going on and it's knocking out connections. Well, maybe you put some kind of redundancy in your system. And so if a lightning strikes a connection, it's OK. But if two bolts strike a connection, the system is now disconnected. So how long do you have to wait before you have two hits in the same place? So there's a lot of applications of you know, the birthday problem. If you do some research online, you know, birthday problems in cryptography, birthday attacks in cryptography, yeah, that's a great <coughs> example of how you can use something like the birthday problem, looking for when things align, looking for applications of a simple problem like this. And that's one of the reasons why I really like this. The other is, you know, if you're teaching calculus, it gives you a great idea of why do we care about the derivative? Why do we care about calculus? We can approximate very complicated functions with simple functions. I understand a straight line. I don't really understand the log of 1 minus k over d. And so the power of something like this <coughs> is a much simpler expression to look at. And then again, you know, when you're teaching this, you know, I'd strongly encourage you to ask your students to come up with other birthday-related problems to look at. You know, what if the birthdays are not equally distributed? Do you think it's more likely or less likely for people to align?
So maybe um, all the days in the first half of the year are twice as likely as all the days in the second half of the year. Do you think it's more likely people line up? What's your intuition say? Yes. Yeah. Because D is kind of shortening D in essence in some ways. So now, you're basically putting a lot more people <coughs> into that first half of the year. They're now in the same box. It feels likely that there should be more and more matches earlier and earlier. I mean, if you go to the extreme case where everybody's born on January 1st, it's going to be very easy to get a match. And so my feeling is I agree with you that the more I cluster them in one small set of the year, the smaller end will be before I have a 50% chance of matching. Other questions you can ask is, how long do you have to wait? The this is calculating the average time. You can calculate the median time, so the number, the number n, such that 50% of the time you have an n that's smaller, 50% of the time you have an n that's larger. Another question you could ask is, what is the most common value of n? So which person is the one on average, or most of the time, to walk in and that's the person that causes the match? You know, do we think it's really around 23? Well, 23 is when we get that 50%. Wait, so the n down here that we just solved for, that's solving for n for Right, how for general d. So if you want, I could be really That's bad. not to get the 50% chance? This is to get the 50% okay. chance. Okay. And so that, I'm saying Qn equals 1 half. So for 50% chance, I end up getting n, and this is where in terms of notation, maybe I should call this n sub d to remind ourselves that this is now depending on how many days we have in the year. And so now not only do we solve the birthday problem, but we can solve it more generally. And if you do a more careful analysis, you can even get estimates for the error. Instead of doing n times n minus 1 times n is n squared, replace this with either n minus a half squared, and it'll be even better. We'll use the quadratic formula, but that's a little bit more painful. This is a pretty good approximation. I would actually do n minus a half squared, and be, you know, just you know, split the difference between n minus 1 and n. But which n do you think is the most likely person to be causing the matches, you know, time goes on? So there's lots of twists you can do on a student problem like this, and I encourage you to have your <coughs> students uh, come up with questions like this. Is there a more, um, I'm not sure answer to this, but intuitive way to solve this and less sort of math intensive? Because I feel like once I get sort of exposing the nerdiness of my family, but right. spent at Thanksgiving, we all got together and we're trying to, without doing this, um, prove why it's 22 or 23. Is this, are there other sort of more intuitive um, ways to do it or no? Because I don't remember doing this, but maybe we do. It's okay, you can get back to it. Yeah, no, I, just, it's okay. I mean, the only ways I really know is writing it somehow like this, is trying to see. <coughs> what could you graph it? Well, I mean, you, you could graph it, but that's coming down to using this algebraic expression. Mm -hmm. And you, you're trying to avoid this algebra entirely? Not entirely. Oh, is, are you willing to it's keep this part, but you want to know yeah. when does it come? Break it down with students who perhaps have never seen calculus yes. before. Yes. Well, that. That's exactly what it is. Okay, well, you can just take it's this. an interesting question. Right. It is. And it to, you, know. <coughs> you can just take this and then just take more and more term, and you can actually do the plot. And so if you do the plot like that, um, yeah. you will be able to see. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you do the plot like that, you will see how things are coming down. So you're graphing this on Excel? Uh, you can graph it on anything you want. Um, Excel would be fine. Right, so here, here's what the plot would look like. And so you know, if you just do a plot like that, okay. you'll start to see roughly where it comes. But you have no idea why it has this shape. And so if you start thinking about what's going on, you know, the more terms you take, the smaller this probability is. But it takes a while for the things to really take into account, to, to really lower things. 364 over 365, it's really close to 1. But one of the things I'm really big on is can you approximate an answer? Can you get a sense of what the answer should be? So when I do this in my probability class, I first do it uh, for the standard birthday problem, and then I do it on Pluto. 
and I give them a, po a couple of possible answers. <coughs> so one of the possible answers is, you know, n equals 500. Most people realize very quickly n is not going to be 500. Then give them, well, what about, one of the other choices is 180, yeah, which is about half the year. So do you think Qn could be as large as 180? Well, when the person walks in at around 180, they've got a 50-50 chance of matching up with somebody in the room. But you would have had to have a bunch of people who are also around 50% walking in for like 179, 178, 177. And since each one of those has about 50% chance, when you have three or four of those people coming in, that gives you a 1 8th, a 1 16th. So it's very unlikely you would get as deep as 180. So with a problem like this, you've got to be well before, I think, 180. And it's just how many of these do we need before it starts really crunching down? Can you just explain to me what the difference is between the question that we're asking? So when okay. you said that it was not who matches your birthday, so to me, in right. my head, that's the same question. So one but thing, one thing, Ali, is to make you question. special and say, what's the probability that somebody in the room shares your birthday? And when I do that, I'm specifying ahead of time who I'm comparing <coughs> to. I want someone to share your birthday. So it doesn't matter if we share the same birthday. It doesn't matter or if Sarah adventure birthday. birthday. It's just, does so anybody share Ali's birthday? birthday. Oh. Oh. oh, okay. Right. And so there's a difference between, you know, if I specify ahead of time who I want the match to be, that's very different than saying, I just want there to be a match. It's much harder if you specify who the match is. But it's much easier if you allow yourself to vary, and I'll take any two people who match. Um, if you want, um, as long as we're here, here's a problem similar to the birthday problem. And I'll just state it if people are interested, I can send stuff on it. Have you heard of the marriage or the secretary problem? <laughs> so, are they related? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the secretary and the divorce problem are related. So there's Lots of different versions. Do you want to do the marriage version or the secretary version? Are they the same? Mathematically, <laughs> yes. The, st the story is slightly different. <laughs> Any preference? Yeah. Sure. Marriage? Go for it. All right. All right, so the way it works is the following. Um, Wherever you're teaching, you know, if I'm teaching at Williams College, I say, you know, to my students, you're a graduate of Williams College. Of course, if you ask someone to marry you, they will clearly say yes. Because you know, you're a graduate of Williams, who wouldn't want to marry you? You know, you've taken probability. You know. The problem is, of course, you know, you don't necessarily know who you want to marry. And so what's going to happen is you're going to see a bunch of candidates one at a time. And when you see a person, you decide at that moment, do you want to marry them or not? And if you want to marry them, you ask them to marry you, and they say yes. If you <coughs> don't want to marry them, you say, no thank you, and they kill themselves because they can't imagine life now that they've been rejected by you. So there's no chance of you hooking up with them later. Now an interesting twist on the problem is to allow you know, the relapse, which you know, definitely has applications to my students' lives at Williams. But we will just assume for simplicity that once you say no to somebody, they are no longer available. We'll assume you know how many people there are who are your candidates to marry. And again, in the real world, you, know, you can start having some interesting conversations as to what is the size of your dating pool, how many people do you think you can date. You really can't date multiple people deeply at the same time. They find out about each other. So we could even you know, vary a little bit what n is in terms of the number of people. And so you have n people, one, two, n. And you see the people one at a time. And you have to decide a strategy to find the best person. And again, the original formulation of the problem is a little bit extreme. <coughs> if you find the best person and marry them, it's considered a success. If you find the second best person and marry them, it's considered a failure. And it's considered the same failure as marrying the, mo the least desirable person. A really nice twist to the problem is to introduce some kind of reward. You really want the best person. You know, and then some kind of decreasing payoff. So at some point you get to the situation where you start to settle. There's a TV show about this right now. It's called The Bachelor. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> no, there's it's, it's, it's some new show. I don't know what it's called, but it's like on MTV, like a real right. world. No. And you start seeing the. And, you start and they go up to the thing, the and up. it tells them, <laughs> and it tells them whether they've made their match because they right. have, they've like set them up in a room with fifty people, okay. and twenty five people have a perfect match. Okay. Anyway, I've never seen it either. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> And so you know, for something like this, as you get towards the end of the group of people, you start really worrying about who you're going to end up with, and you will start to settle. Now again, when you're giving a real proposal in real life, you don't go, will you settle for me? But, um, so the question is, what is your best strategy to find the optimal person? And again, the secretary version is just you know, you're interviewing candidates for a job. And you know, once you interview somebody, if you don't offer them the job on the spot, they will go and they will get a job somewhere else. So you have just one shot to get somebody. And so this, you know, can somebody tell me a low bound for the probability of success of ending up with the best person? So if you have n people, get best at least what percent of the time? So give me a strategy that will give you the best person at least a fixed percent of the time. And again, we will assume all, all in fact, all arrangements of the people are equally likely. The best person can be anywhere, the worst person can be anywhere. Choose arbitrarily and you get one out of N. Yep. You get the best at least one over N. Always. Because that's saying that one out of the N people is the best. <coughs> Fixed spot. So maybe you like the number five. And you will always take whoever's in the fifth spot no matter what. And so you get 1 over n of the time you win. As n gets large, this is not so good. So the question is, what is the best strategy? And so I don't want to go into too much detail now. If anybody wants to, I have this written up. I can send the solution. So look at first k people, where k is approximately n over e. Take first e person. I'm sorry. E okay, so e is about 2.71828. It's the base of the natural logarithms. And it's very interesting why e shows up in this problem. Take the first person better than the best you've seen. So what we're doing is we're going to spend some time researching people. We're going to look at the first k people that come in and get some sense of the sample, the space that it lives in. And then we will take the first person better than the best we've seen. If the best person is in the first K, we automatically lose. If the second best person is in the first K, and the best person isn't, we always win. Then, of course, you, there's a lot of other cases to analyze. What if there's no way that great in the first K? <coughs> it doesn't matter how great they are, there will still be some. Right, but then I'm the saying best. you'll pick. The best one in the second, the first one you like better than that person in the second game. Right. Still so the second. imagine the people are going to increasing order. Mm -hmm. And then what you would do is you would take the worst person of the remaining group. Wait, say that again? So imagine the people are ranked in increasing order. So the worst person is first, second worst is second, yeah. best person is the last. If you do the strategy, the worst K people are the people you see. And the first person better than the best you've seen is actually the worst of the remaining people. So it's absolutely possible you will end up with the worst remaining person. Right. Because okay. normally you'll never end up with the last person. Normally you won't. Although, Even if that's well, the last person. You will end up with the last person if the best person is in the first N. I'm sorry, if the best person is in the first K, <coughs> then you will always end up with the last person because you never see anybody better. Okay. So you will sometimes end up with the last person. So the fascinating thing is, if you take the first person better than the best scene, you get the best approximately 1 over E, or I think about 37% of the time. I <laughs> what was that? I just asked her if she thinks that this show on MTV really has some sort of mathematical strategy behind it. Are you, are you checking now? I'm right there. 
I mean, it should, it should have both here. Whether or not the MTV candidates know about this. No, they do, and they go up to uh, like a screen that says, like, you found your match. And okay. they don't, I think if they find their match, this like calculated perfect match, right. then they win something. And if they don't, I don't know what happens to them if they don't. But <laughs> they die. <laughs> they die. <laughs> But in this case scenario, are, are we assuming that the probability... We're assuming each person is equally likely to be in any place. So all n factorial arrangements of people are equally likely. So again, with something like this, you can have the students just you know, write an Excel program and randomly arrange people. I don't know. And then you can choose a K, and you can see how well you do for different well, values of K. I just put it in. What's absolutely amazing is you get a number like 37%. If n is 10,000, 37% of the time, you're getting the best person. Absolutely shocking that the probability is this high. The k, though, is that a free choice? Like, no. The, well, if k, k is a free choice, the optimal k to take is oh, about Oh, you n. know n. Okay. I know n. You know n. And so okay. then, you know, if you really want to make the problem fun, is you say, well, what if I don't know n? What if n is drawn from a distribution? What should I choose k to be? Let's say n is drawn from a uniform distribution from 100 to 200. What's, and then again, you have all these different questions. What is the metric I should use to evaluate? So there's lots of things you can do if you want to get this to students in the stats class. They can run the simulations. They can have a computer program randomly order you know, the first 100 people. And then you can just tell them, look at the first k, choose the first person better than that. Or have them come up with whatever strategies they want. If n is 100, you expect to get the best person if you just randomly choose 1 over 100 of the time. But the idea here is, by sampling a little bit in the beginning, we can get an inkling as to what's happening later. And so it's a very strange pattern that can be seen here. And so you know, this is you know, somewhat related to you know, the problem we were talking about a little bit earlier, with you know, the birthday problem. Um, you know, the, the answers for questions like this are often very surprising you know, the first time you see them. That, you know, it's only as low as 23 people that I need before I have a match. I have a strategy where 37% of the time, I will get the best person. <coughs> if you're willing to take the first or the second best, and really, you know, can you tell the difference between the best and the second best, you can get essentially 50% without too much trouble. And if you go, well, what if you're willing to just take somebody in the top 2%? You know, how often will you get somebody in the top 2% with a very simple strategy like this? So, you know, again, one of the things that I love to do is to have students, you know, have the opportunity to explore a little bit more. Okay. This one feels like it has a lot more assumptions than the birthday one. Okay, so what assumptions do you think this one has? That you're getting better each time you're, you choose someone? What do you mean by you're getting uh, where are we making that assumption? Aren't you saying that two is better than one, three is better than oh, two? Oh, no, no, no. I was saying because Sarah was saying, what if I was giving an example to Sarah's question of how we could end up with the worst possible person who's left. And uh, I was saying, if oh, these people are ordered. So three is worse than four. Right. If we okay. make, right, but that's not necessarily true. Okay. We don't know how the people are ordered. Okay. And so you know, this leads into, you know, if you do sorting algorithms, if I give you a randomly sorted set, and I want to then put it in order, how long does the algorithm take? And well, there are certain pathological sets that are very bad for specific sorting algorithms. And so if I give you people in reverse order from worst to best, this is a horrible strategy. But most of the time, you're not going to have people ordered from worst to best. The people are going to fall evenly. Um, did you have a comment? No. Why does... This may be a little question, but why does E make an appearance here? I'm trying to think what's the easiest way to explain why E makes an appearance. <coughs> um, like I just would have never guessed that that number had anything to do with this topic. The reason is because this is a good math problem, so it has to involve either E or pi or another funny <laughs> <laughs> um, okay we're, no, we're, not, we're not on a circle. I'm okay with that. That's one of the hardest things I have explained to my kids, like where E comes from sometimes. Alright, so again, I, I have no planned agenda. If people want 
to, to actually show where e comes from this, I'd have to do the calculation a little bit, and you'd have to see the logarithms. I can show you a related problem where e should not make an appearance but does. And so if you'll accept that as a friendly sure. argument. <laughs> I'll accept your first answer. It's a good math problem. That's fine. So here's a fun problem. Given n equals 100, break into positive integers a1, a2, dot, 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 a n, so that the product a1, a2, dot, 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 a n is as large <coughs> as possible. So that's the problem I want to do. I want to break this product, I'm sorry, I want to break this number 100 into pieces so that the product is as large as possible. Using factors of it or using... Nope, anyway, split 100 into some sum. So I want a1 plus a2 plus a n has to equal 100. <laughs> So why would I not allow zero? Because in the product zero. Yeah, in the product zero. Why would I allow negative numbers? They're the same as positive numbers. I'm sorry? They're basically the same as positive numbers when you multiply, except sometimes you get a negative answer. OK. So what would that do to how large the product could be? Well, if you have an odd number of negative numbers, mm -hmm. I mean, are you assuming that it's a, like what? Well, I'm saying, I'm giving you the problem where I'm only allowing you to use positive integers. We, we, we shouldn't Just in use... case you have an odd number of negatives, then it will give you a negative product. Well, that? but then that just means I don't use that. So, why what do you if have I give us that? If I have an even number of negatives, I could write 100 as 200 minus 50 minus 50. Oh, well, there's an infinite number of ways to do it then. And I could just make my product arbitrarily large. I could write it as... You know, 200 minus 50 minus 50. I could do um, 1,200. Right. Put it over here. And I can just make my product arbitrarily large. So if I allow myself negatives, the problem is foolish. If I allow myself zero, you know, I would never use a zero. So I only want to look at positive integers. So does anybody have a guess as to the best thing I can do? Somewhere in the middle? Okay, so what would you guess? Like 49, 51 maybe? Okay, so one guess is 49 times 51. Now you could actually write this, I, don't, I can't do real math, as 50 minus 1 times 50 plus 1, which would be 2 five, zero, zero, minus one. So there's something you can do that's better than 49 times 51. So 50 times 50 would actually be a little bit better. But you can also use more numbers than that. Ah, so what could we do that's better than 50 times 50? 50 times 48 times two. Okay, so 50 times 48 times 2, the 48 times 2 beats the 50. <coughs> so the question is, what's the best way to break this up? Can you do it again? 48 times 2 times 48 times 2. So sure, I could. I mean, you just keep going in that direction, right? Yeah, so how far do you think we keep going? <laughs> okay, so I like where you're going. So here's the thing. Yeah, so we get eight. Imagine you have the number 10 as one of the sums. I can replace 10 with 8 times 2. Right? And 8 times 2 will give me a better product than 10. So could I ever have 10 as one of my sums? Well, you should I wouldn't want to. If any of the A's were 10, I could replace them with 8 times 2. Similarly, if I had an 11 or a 12 or 13. What if I had a 9? Well, then you could replace a 9 if one of the A's was a 9 with. 7 
times two. Seven times two. What about an eight? Six times two. What about a seven? Etc. Etc. times two. Six. Four times two. Five. Three times two. Now things get a little interesting. What about a four? It's the same. It's the same. So why not break up all fours with two times two? Because then we don't have to have any fours. What about three? It has to be an integer, right? It has to be an integer. Mm -hmm. Six times one is the only... Right, and that's worse than three. Right. So I don't want to break up threes. So I know my answer involves only twos and threes. Only twos and threes. So which do you think you want more of? Do you want more twos or do you want more threes? Why can't you just say only fours and threes? You could, well, you might actually have a two left over. So you could say only twos, threes, and fours. But why not break the fours into okay. twos? I know two is possible, I know three is possible. If I do this, then I don't have any three, then I don't have any fours. So which do you think you want more, twos or threes? Threes. Why? Because they're bigger. I'm really for a big number. Ah, but <coughs> there's more twos, right? So when you multiply, when you multiply. Two to the 50th power, is that what? So one possibility is 2 to the 50th power, another is like 3 to the 39th power, or maybe, oh sorry, 3 to the 33rd power, and then a 1. So your, your candidates may be like 2 to the 50, 3 to the 33 times 1, 3 to the 32 times 2 squared. These are the natural candidates. And it turns out this is the best. And this will be answering your question, Ben. So which would you rather have, a bunch of twos or a bunch of threes? I'm guessing two. Okay, why? She guessed three. Okay. <laughs> I will say that one of you is correct. So is there any way to align twos and threes in this? And we're looking at sums. How many twos are equivalent to threes? We're trying to write it as a sum. Two, two, two times one is two threes. I'm sorry? Three twos is two threes. Three twos is two threes. Right? Two plus two plus two is the same as three plus three. Which gives you a better product? Two times two times two or three times three? Three times three. Three times three. <coughs> What's really going on here is E is about 2.718 is closer to 3. And so when, you really, when you're doing this, um, you know, if you want, email me and I will give you the more detailed write-up where you actually see E coming in through calculus. And so there's really a calculus maximization problem lurking in the background. And the reason why we end up with more 3s than 2s is E is closer to 3 than it is to 2. So the question, of course, is why would we care about something like this? Well, you know, I'm doing this with positive integers. I can replace these, you know, with just real numbers. An application of this is for computer storage. When you're trying to find what is the most efficient way to store information on a computer, base 3 is actually better than base 2. In terms of our computer algorithms, it's much easier to work base 2. You know, search, you know, binary search is very nice. For a lot of things in computer architecture, base 2 is better. But there are some papers on the advantages of working base 3. And the whole purpose of this problem is, if I'm trying to represent my numbers in a base other than 2 or other than 10, this is an argument for using base 3. So, I hope this gives you, you know, some sense of where you can you know, start to emerge in problems like this. And I thought I would do one more thing and then take a you know, brief break. And so, I'm always interested in patterns. And so I thought I would show you a video of an interesting pattern. But before showing the video, I just have to explain uh, where it's coming from. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the grid of all you know, pairs of integers. 
So here in the center is 0, 0, uh, 1, 0, 2, 0, uh, 0, 1, etc., etc., etc. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start writing the numbers over here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And whenever I get a prime number, I will fill it in. So I'll make it red. 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13. Okay? So this is called Oolong's Fiber. I probably should have written this in you know, larger size than this one. So this is a completely open problem. I think we have maybe some small partial results. But as you keep spiraling outwards, you keep writing the numbers in a spiral like this, what kind of patterns do you see? And so what I thought I would do now is just you know, move this and show you a video on Huh, interesting. I'm getting some kind of strange I'm getting these purple yellow lines coming through, so sadly the video is probably not going to come out. But. <coughs> so I'm going to play the video of adding the points and tell me when you start seeing. Oh. So this is the first, you know, ten spirals. Does anybody see any patterns? Yeah, you saw that very fast. I don't, I don't. So you you saying <laughs> so the dots are the the dots numbers? are the primes. So I'm spiraling out. What here's two, here's three, here's five, here's seven, eleven, thirteen. So some people are beginning to see some very long straight lines. The, the primes seem to be lining up. And so let's go a little bit further. Looks like a city, but you know, what you might start to notice is you've got these huge, almost highways in the city, you know, these 45 degree lines. And so the question is, you know, why are these emerging? Will they emerge if you do other shapes? What if you used a you know, hexagonal thing instead of you know, the square lattice? What if you did things other than primes? You know, when do you see patterns like this? And so again, you know, the hard part is always you know, finding time to do stuff like this.